You have seen in the previous video how to recover a database when a database file is lost or corrupted on the server. Let's now see what to do when the server itself fails. Obviously, if you just run the backup on your computer and let Oracle store everything in the flash recovery area, you'll be in a bad position. You must therefore follow your backup with a copy, either to an external device or across the network to another computer, of the backup sets, as well as the archive log files, just in case. Don't forget that if our man takes care of the database files proper and of the parameter file, you may have to enjoy the configuration files such as the listener parameter file, in which case backing them up too may be a good idea. So, let's say that your usual server is kaput. But you have another usable server, and you want to restore the database on this server to ensure business continuity using the most recent backup. What you need in order to recover your database on another similar server is first to install Oracle Express in exactly the same way as on the original server in the same directories on Windows. Don't forget the directories where control files and read log files are mirrored. When you have installed Oracle Express, shut it down and remove the database that was installed. Delete all the .dbf files under raw data and delete the files, keep the directories, in the flash recovery area. In their place, copy the files from the backup you want to restore. Check file on a ship, particularly under Linux, if you perform some tasks as a root. Delete SP file xe.error and init xe.error under Oracle Home and create a new init xe.error that only contains three lines. One to name the database xe, one to tell where the flash recovery area here on Linux is located. This is important since this is where Armand will have to restore the data from. And one to give a size to the flash recovery area. Say 10G, the actual value isn't important. You are set to restore your database on the other server, but then there is something important, which is the DBID. The DBID is a unique numerical identifier assigned by Oracle to a database, and you must know the original DBID of a database before you can restore it on a different server. The official way to get the DBID is to connect with the database and run a very simple query. Then you note it down and keep it to a safe place. If you have failed to note down the DBID of the database you want to restore or have lost it, everything isn't lost. Just go to the flash recovery area, into the backup set directory, and head for the most recent .bkp file that you want to restore. On Linux, run the strings command against the bkp file and grab for max value. As soon as you see a number followed by a comma and by max value, hit Ctrl C because otherwise it can be long. The number is the DBID you are looking for. Under Windows, run the find command. You will see more exotic characters, but you should see something similar. Once again, hit Ctrl C when the information is displayed. Now that everything is ready, let's go and connect to Arman. First thing, I set the DBID to the original value of the database I want to restore, and that was created on another machine. I have to do this if I want to be able to restore the control file. Then, I use startup no mount. Oracle looks first for an SP file XE, doesn't find any since we have deleted it, then looks for an init XE.error and find the three line one we have created. It reads the name of the database from this file as well as the location of the flash recovery area. All of the parameters take the full values. Since we know where the flash recovery area is located, we can restore the real SP file from the auto backup. At this stage, if we have exactly the same directory structure as on the original machine, we can restart the database still with no mount, that is, that we don't open the control file, since so far we have none. This time, we have the SP file XE, and this is the one we open and read. This one contains all the real parameters, in particular the location for the control files. We can then restore the control file, which will be copied to the right location or locations, if it's mirrored. We have everything, and from now on, we mustn't keep the same DBID. As I have no idea what my DBID should be now, I take the easy route and exit, only to reconnect. When I'm connected, I see the DBID which is different from the one I said previously. That's fine. I start the database once again, but this time with a mount to open the control file. Remember that all the information about how backup sets relate to data files is in the control file. I can then run Restore Database, which takes some time. 
followed by a recover database in case I would have usable archive redo log files. Remember that the control file I have restored was of the control file at the time of the backup. It will try to progress in time, so to speak, by looking for the redo log file that covers the next interval of time, apply it, look for the next one, and so on, until it doesn't find any next file. At this point, it will fail with the error RMAN06054, which means nothing more than I'm at the end of the road and have nothing else to apply. Finally, I can open the database with reset logs to say that I have nothing to read from an online reader log file. But there is something that will worry any business. I take a backup at T0 and transfer the backup sets to a safe place. Then we work with the database until something nasty occurs. We have seen how we can restore the backup on another server. But if you remember the previous video, there was something important in the recovery process, the application of all the archive redo log files, as well as of the online log file. That's how we could lose no transaction. If you can access all these files and transfer them to the new server, apart from the juggling with the DBID, the recovery process on the new server is similar to what we have seen in the previous video. Actually, if you can transfer the online redo log file, you don't need to say reset logs. But usually, in the case of a real disaster, you won't be able to get these files. They will be lost with the computer. That means that you are going to lose everything that happened between T0 and the disaster. If you back up your database every night, it means that you may lose a full day of work. You will necessarily lose what was in the online read log file. But there is something you can do with archived files. Because when a file is archived, you can send it over and make it rejoin the backup. This is a mechanism known as log shipping, and the principle behind DataGuard that is only available with the expensive enterprise edition. What I'm going to show you is DataGuard on a shoestring. The big question when you are planning for a disaster recovery solution is what data loss you can bear. Of course, if you ask, the answer will be zero. But the problem is that depending on the answer, the cost will be very different. It is possible to achieve zero loss, but the price is high and there is a big performance penalty. If human lives aren't at stake, you don't need zero loss. Remember that we are planning for an exceptional event. If you can lose 10 minutes worth of data without facing imminent business collapse, then I have a solution for you that will cost you nothing but a spare server. Remember that the way it works is that you have one active online reader log group. When it fills up, the SGA is flushed to data files, Oracle switches to the other online reader log group, and the previous one is archived. Only snag. When you install Oracle Express, the log files are created with a size of 50 MB. How long does it take to fill up 50 MB? You can get the answer for your database from the view named vdollarloghist that tells you when each log file was first written or overwritten. It is likely with a small database that left to itself Oracle will take a very, very long time before it fills one read log file which means that your most recent archived file may well be pretty old when the disaster strikes. We could think of resizing the read log files, it's not very easy but can be done, but actually, first, their minimal size is 4 megs, and there is no certainty that it will fill up as fast as you want. You usually have periods with very few changes applied to the database, and some transactions may linger on in the online read log much too long for your taste. You must force online redo logs to switch, so that they can be archived. One solution is to use the alter system switch log file command, which can be scheduled at regular intervals. When the file is archived, the size of the archived isn't the size of the online redo log file, but just the size of what has been written so far. But there is better. There is a parameter that you can set, archived like target, which says, in seconds, how often you should archive log files? The minimum value is 60. I ask for redo log files to be archived every 10 minutes. A record will keep the time and switch at the specified interval, thus triggering archival. I have implemented log shipping on Linux. There are many different ways to do it. But I have used a secure shell and rsync over SSH for transport. You can easily find information about rsync if you want to implement the same solution. Then I have created a cron file. For Windows users, cron is the Linux scheduler. And written this into it. 
it should be a single line, that asks to synchronize the main server and the backup server every 5 minutes, to be certain to have at most a 10 minute delay between the two machines, with flags that say T to preserve the file time during the copy, R for recursion on subdirectories, and Z to compress the file for the transfer. I have also added a command that says to delete on the target server files that are not on the source server, I'm going to explain why shortly. It is followed by the name of the directory to replicate, then the name of the target server, in my case dr underscore host, dr for disaster recovery, and where to replicate. Note that there is a difference of one level between the source and the target directory, it's not a mistake, and that backup sets will also be automatically transferred by this command. Thus, every 10 minutes at most, an archived log file will be forwarded to dr underscore host. Now, let's see what happens on dr underscore host. I could accumulate log files and replay them when I restore the database, but the more log files I apply, the longer it will take to recover the database. Try to figure out that you have had a big hardware failure. A lot of people are around claiming they need the database and asking when it will be available. So what I'm going to do is that I will apply log files as they arrive, keeping my disaster recovery database in the starting blocks. It is called a standby database. This is why I have said delete in the rsync command. Since backups will delete obsolete log files on the primary database, by the time they become obsolete, they will have long been applied, and letting rsync do the cleanup is just fine. I have just shown to you the sequence of operations for restoring a backup on another server. The only thing we need to do is just not to open the database and apply the recovery statement repeatedly. I can easily write a shell script that will be run by cron. First, I set up all of the required environment variables. I also get my directory, because I want to write a temporary file. If this temporary file is present, I remove it. Then, I run the recover command, check for the presence of or hyphen or amen hyphen in the output, which denotes an error, and replace all spaces by hyphens simply to keep everything as one piece of information. Every message that can be an error message is written to the temporary file. Actually, I expect an error, RMAN 06054 that says that I have nothing to apply. If the last error I got was something else, then I had a real error, and I ran in my temporary file to keep it for inquiry. It would be a good idea at this stage to email the DBA so that the problem can be fixed before the standby database is needed. I call this script apply redo, and I can schedule it every 5 minutes too, but 1 minute after our sync on the other machine. Now, what when the standby database has to take the place of the failed main database? The operations aren't difficult, but I prefer to script everything I may have to do in a panic, and I call my script activate. I set my environment variables, then the thing I mustn't forget to do is to stop applying redo files, I save what is currently scheduled, regenerate a file with everything except apply redo, and reschedule everything. Then, I explicitly run apply redo once again just in case. I assume that apply redo and activate are in the same directory. And finally, I open my database with the reset logs closed. Of course, you need to make your clients, application server, and everything point to the new server now. But as far as database operations are concerned, you are done, and you have a database that is only 10 minutes at most behind the original one. For the record, the true data guard may be much closer behind the primary database because it uses more sophisticated mechanisms, but principles are not very different.